Hello and welcome to this week's topic. Today we'll be talking about the business case for sustainability, or basically why sustainability makes good business sense. The topic ILOs or intended learning outcomes for this week are firstly to define what sustainable practice means for business, identify the ways in which sustainability can create value for business, or in other words, the business case. And thirdly, recognize that sustainability is no longer a peripheral business issue, but has become more mainstream. So let's start with the first Tylo, define what sustainable practice means for business. To begin with, it's useful to have a working definition of what a business case is. And the definition that we have is a, it's a justification for a proposed project or undertaking on the basis of its expected commercial benefit. It evaluates the benefit, the cost and risk of alternative options to provide a rationale for the preferred solution. That's a lot of words, but basically what it means is using an example is let's say that your staff needs training. So in order to justify why you're going to spend any money on the training, it's necessary to put a business case forward to the managers as to why it's necessary. So it's a cost benefit analysis of sorts. Now, moving on what the business case for sustainability is specifically, it basically intends to um, realize economic successes through an intelligent design of voluntary environmental and social management. So there are key, three key requirements um, when it comes to articulating a business case for sustainability. Firstly, it has to obviously be a problem that's either societal or, env or environmental in nature that you're addressing. Secondly, it has to create um, a positive contribution to the economic success of the company, which can be measured. So in other words, if you're asking for making an investment into solving a social or environmental problem, then you need to be able to demonstrate from the business's point of view, what benefit will accrue to the business. And then secondly, um, you need to have some kind of evidence. So that's where, you know, when you're determining the cost benefit analysis is saying, well, how do you prove that you're going to achieve what it is you intend or you set out to, right? Because organizational resources are very scarce. And so when you're going to senior management team or to your direct line manager, it becomes important to get them to believe um, that you will achieve what you intend to set out to achieve. So another way to think of a business case is to contrast it with a business plan that you've probably heard of. So the key difference between a business plan and a business case is that a business plan basically sets out the entire company strategy and the expected financial performance in one, two or three years. And business plans are often presented to potential investors, to banks, and also to internal um, stakeholders. A business case tends to be a lot more project focused um, and it's the mechanism through which a business generates its profit. So in other words, as I said, a cost benefit analysis of saying, well, if we were to invest in say education for the community, what is the expected cost and the associated return? And so you're presenting a case which proves to justify why that investment is a good idea. Now, following on from this, one of the key challenges is, you know, often when it comes to say a business investing in community education or in solving an environmental issue, obviously that comes at a cost, right? Um, but it's important to try and justify that there will actually be a benefit to the business as well from doing this. So that's where business case is different because you're trying to articulate clearly how it is that those benefits will come back into the business. 
So often that means it's required that a business case is linked to, say, the accounting and management and measurement of these sorts of initiatives, to the strategy of the business, or to actually new product development or any kind of innovation. So just to summarize what we've been discussing then so far, you need to be able to answer these four questions confidently when putting forward the business case. Firstly, is sustainability at the core of the company's business strategy? If it's a peripheral issue, you often find it's harder to put a, forward a compelling case. Secondly, do companies believe that the costs of sustainability outweigh the benefits? So again, your role will be to demonstrate that the benefits do indeed outweigh the costs. And thirdly, um, academic research and business experience suggest the opposite. Actually, to be honest, I think it's a bit mixed, the results, where um, you can show that sustainability is linked positively to the bottom line, so engaging in corporate social responsibility or sustainability initiatives, but sometimes that financial link is hard to prove. And we'll see later on that, and that's because the benefits to the business can often be non-financial um, as well. And then finally, and we'll talk about this in a bit more detail soon, when you have embedded sustainability efforts, in other words, when they are part of your business as usual, not a kind of add-on, you find that there tends to be a more positive impact on the business performance in that case, rather than something that's bolted on or sort of considered as an afterthought. And we'll go through some examples of that as well. Before we delve into this section, it becomes important to understand what we mean by sustainable or sustainability practices. So there are two key characteristics. One, there are activities that business undertakes that do not harm people or the planet and at best create value for their stakeholders. And secondly, there's a focus on improving environmental, social and governance, sometimes collectively called ESG, um, performance. And this is not only in the core business, but also in the operations, in the supply and value chain, or to their customers. Often, sustainability tends to be conflated with corporate social responsibility. Now, it's outside the scope of this subject to clearly define the difference, but something like supporting an employee volunteering program in the community, According to some research, it suggests it's not a form of sustainability, but as I said, I think anything that has an environmental, social or governance lens can be considered for the purposes of what you're learning in this subject as a sustainability related activity. Now for the review and reflect of this um, Tylo, I've chosen a company called Interface, which is a flooring and carpet manufacturer, a global um, company. The CEO of the company, Ray Anderson, has long been a sustainability champion. And you can see there's actually a TED talk with Ray Anderson um, that, he developed, that, that he delivered on the importance of sustainability at Interface. We won't get to cover that now, um, but this is particularly important um, because it shows how Interface is both sustainable and profitable. So in other words, it presents what the business case for sustainability is from Interface's perspective. Okay, but for this particular review and reflection, what I'd like you to do is do some research on what Interface does in relation to sustainability. So go to their homepage, and then I'm going to play a video now on networks to see how an initiative that Interface runs that manages to turn waste into profit. Okay, so that's a project specific focus, but it's a really good example of how the interface has presented a strong business case for networks um, to the company. Okay, enjoy. I always believe that you can do business at the same time contributing for very serious objectives like cleaning the oceans of marine debris. 
So it's not a charity. This is an enterprise, a social enterprise. Networks is a program that takes discarded fishing nets from coastal communities and arranges the recycling of those fishing nets back into carpet fibre that we can use in our modular flooring. What we're doing with Networks is creating a new and innovative and practical example of an inclusive business model. Groups from the communities go out into the environment, collect nets off the beaches or from the sea, and they get nets from fishers at the end of life to prevent them from getting into the environment in the first place. As a group, the community then sell the nets into a global supply chain and they're regenerated into nylon yarn that can then be used to make some very beautiful products, such as interfaces carpet tires. Developing inclusive business is not about philanthropic giving. We're doing this to demonstrate that there is a better way of doing business. What we want to do with networks is ensure that as much of the value of the nets is retained within the community in order for the communities to benefit as much as possible. They realise that instead of just throwing their nets on the ocean or just anywhere, it is something that they can earn from. So, na minus-minus ang mga basura kay ang mga membro mo participate man sa makooperate man sa pagpanguha sa pukot ng mga basura. Through these network projects, some values and attitude actually change. Attitude change is quite difficult to convince because it comes from inside the person. But if one's shown you know, doing that change, it's really a miracle happening. Saving is not something that they're you know, used to do. It is something that they not even know it's possible. The ability to save money kind of helped them to plan for the future, especially as I observe they're more looking into the education of their children. Sa akong mga anak na lima, mao yun ay kanunay na kong gitanom sa ilang huna-huna nga unsa ang network, unsa ka importante. Network, nga pinakamaayo, nga project, dili ilang para na ako o para sa anak nila. It's a huge achievement to have got to where we have got to and to be able to sit here today and look around at all the huge quantity of nets that are here and realize the amount of work that's actually gone into that. I think it's been a huge success. So success for me for the Networks programme, having now established that the initial programme is viable, is to expand that beyond. To also influence the broader manufacturing community to explore inclusive business opportunities in their supply chain. And we're very pleased to say that ZSL has just been awarded two three-year programmes from the Darwin Initiative to fund marine conservation in two remote areas. And networks will be an integral part of those programs. Well, it's very, very fulfilling to be involved in a project like networks because that puts you in a situation where you can actually initiate some sort of paradigm shifting. So looking at plastics from a different angle. And when people start looking at plastics in pesos and dollars term, that's probably one thing we should be initiating all over the world where we can address the issue of plastics worldwide. Okay, now that you've learned generally what a business case is and what we mean by a business case for sustainability, let's get into the practical ways in which sustainability can create value for business. So in other words, what the business case for sustainability is. From your prescribed reading, which is Whelan, the Whelan and Fink article, they identify six key areas in which there is a strong business case for sustainability. So they show that companies that proactively make sustainability core to their business strategy will drive innovation and engender enthusiasm and loyalty from employees, customers, suppliers, communities, and investors. We'll start off with how sustainability can drive competitive advantage through stakeholder engagement. 
Okay, so one of the some of the more strategic value of sustainability really comes from businesses' engagement with its key stakeholders. So, for example, through working with government and being proactive in terms of regulation that might be impacting your sector, or working with local communities who give you the social license to operate. These are ways that if you proactively manage, you can achieve competitive advantage. The second key area that's where sustainability can improve, um, sorry, where sustainability can create value is through improving risk management. So if you think about a company's supply chain, for example, so supply chains are very vulnerable to natural disasters and civil conflict issues like climate change, water scarcity, and poor labor conditions. Um, all these are sustainability issues that can affect your supply chain. So an important way you can manage risk is to, again, pro be proactive about working with supply chains in order to make sure that that risk isn't realized. But I mean, there are other areas of risk management, say around reputation management, that's another important area. So uh, an example is, a recent example is that of Rio Tinto in Australia, who as part of their mining activities destroyed some heritage caves in the Palabra region of Australia. And as a result, there was significant backlash from their stakeholders, particularly shareholders. And it led to the, some of the top executives and the chairman of the board resigning. So that kind of risk can and should have been managed better from the business. And the third area is that sustainability fosters or can foster innovation. So for example, companies like Tesla and others in the um, electric car market have shown how you can turn innovation for sustainability into competitive and financial returns. So we're starting to see more and more companies innovating in the area of sustainability. Now, many businesses think that you can't have sustainability and good financial performance because it costs to be sustainable, but there's not often that reward. So in addition to say, this isn't really true because in addition to say driving competitive advantage, which can improve performance, managing risk that we've spoken about, which can improve performance, companies are also finding ways to save a lot of cost through environmental sustainability related operational efficiencies. So for example, being more energy efficient that lowers a company's costs, which then the net effect would be improved financial performance. Now, when it comes to building customer loyalty, a lot of businesses are skeptical about whether their consumers will actually pay more for sustainable, so sustainable products. Um, but there is a shift happening there in the minds of consumers. Consumers are expecting businesses to be more transparent, honest, and show that their products don't have harmful effects to the environment, to society, et cetera. So I think there's a lot happening in terms of the consumer space that is driving companies to change their behaviors and strengthening the business case for sustainability. Finally, there's a lot of research to suggest that the new wave or the new generation of employees are expecting that their employers are more sustainable. So sustainability initiatives that are aimed at improving ESG performance and creating value for society, these can increase your employee loyalty, efficiency, and productivity, and can also improve, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, greater recruitment, retention, and the morale of staff. Okay, now for this section, we're going to look at the difference between sustainability that's bolted onto a business or one that is embedded within the business. So I mentioned earlier, one of the key drivers for the business case is that you should have sustainability integrated ideally within your corporate strategy, not something that you do on the side. 
Okay, so that's called embedded sustainability. So that's when you incorporate environmental health, social value into the core business without a trade-off in price or quality. In other words, where there is no social or green premium. Now, as I said, companies that are seen as forerunners in sustainability, like um, interface carpets, companies like Tesla, these companies are seen to offer high quality products at competitive prices. IKEA is another example of a company that's invested heavily in sustainability, but doesn't necessarily charge consumers a green or a sustainability premium for it. And that's because it's embedded in every part of the business. So now many managers see that there are opportunities we still continue to see businesses that add on sustainability or bolt on to existing strategy and operations. So for example, when a company has, say, a, um, you know, a clean the environment day for its staff, or if they, you know, in a very ad hoc way, invest in environmental or social initiatives and not really integrated in the business, the value is a lot harder to, um, demonstrate that way. So one of the ways that, you know, bolt-on sustainability differs from more embedded sustainability can be seen along these five dimensions. Firstly, the goal of embedded sustainability is to pursue sustainable value, not just shareholder value. And what that means is there's a combination and recognition of performance along environmental, social, and financial lines, and not just financial lines. In terms of scope, as I mentioned, embedded sustainability requires transformation at every step of the value chain and part of the business, not as in an ad hoc or symbolic way um, necessarily. From the customer's point of view, customers are, of course, getting a lot smarter where they don't want to be what we call greenwashed by companies' businesses. In other words, they on the surface, they look sustainable, but if you really look perhaps at where they were made, the conditions under which they were made, you know, then customers start to become a bit more skeptical. What you really want are solutions where there is no trade-off in quality and no social or green premium for the products. In terms of value capture, so what that means is where is it that you're going to create that value along the, along the value chain? With embedded sustainability, it's, and I'll show you these seven levels um, of sustainable value creation in just a bit, but essentially that means is that you're trying to be sustainable at every stage of the value chain, not just in your marketing to consumers at the end of the day. Okay, and then finally in the value chain, this is where Again, it's about looking at the whole life cycle of the product and identifying where it is that companies can have an impact in terms of the sustainability credentials. So for example, I have this box of tissues with me. Now, looking at the value chain, that means looking at the time where the trees were grown to make the paper, the time where that was processed, that pulp was processed into paper, et cetera, et cetera, until this box has landed on my desk, but not, not only landed on my desk, but also including how I dispose of this box of tissue at the end. Is this material recyclable? There's some plastic, there's some cardboard. How do people use the product? All these considerations um, need to be taken into account in terms of the value chain. Okay, now for this slide, which looks at the levels of sustainable value creation that I mentioned in the previous slide, there are essentially seven ways in which, or levels rather, in which value can be created from a sustainability point of view. As I mentioned, firstly, around risk, which is the first level. So, you know, you can create value for your business by reducing the level of risk in areas around sustainability to its reputation, to the costs, to the um, you know, 
stakeholder engagement. There are all these ways you can manage the risk. The next level that you can create value from sustainability is say through reducing energy, waste, and your materials. Then thirdly, you can differentiate your products from your competitors as being more sustainable. Sustainability also allows you to enter new markets. So, you know, there might, there's this um, concept called the bottom of the pyramid, which basically in the shape of a pyramid suggests that the greatest value is actually available in the lowest socioeconomic parts of the world because you have much larger populations and, and a growing and emerging middle class. So there's a huge opportunity to target that particular segment with um, more sustainable alternatives. And then it also allows you to protect and enhance your brand. As I said, from a reputational and image point of view, there's a lot of opportunity there. It also helps to influence um, industry standards. So a lot of businesses have started to say report their performance along say the GRI, which is called the Global Reporting Initiative. So they're adopting similar standards across how they report um, their sustainability performance. But you also have the opportunity for say, if, if one of the competitors, say in Australia, you know, one supermarket decided to ban the use of plastic bags. Okay, so that first mover in that space led to a flow on effect where the, all the other grocery stores then decided to ban the use of single use plastic bags. So there's an opportunity to create that, that sea change in a systematic way. And then finally, of course, the opportunity is that of radical innovation. So this is where a business is transformed altogether from being relatively unsustainable to being sustainable. So if you imagine a, if a coal company transforms itself into being purely focused on renewable energy, that would be an example of a radical innovation or transformation. All right, so for the review and reflection part of this uh, particular Tylo, what I'd like you to do, this is a very short case study on the Coca-Cola company's activities in Zambia. So I want you to do two things. Firstly, of course, to read this um, mini case study in some detail. If you've read the case study, what I'd like you to do is, you know, using the framework of, um, you know, the drivers of the business case from the Whelan and Fink article, I would like you to identify if and how the Coca-Cola case study in Zambia meets each of the following business drivers. So for the final topic ILO, we're going to look at how sustainability is no longer a peripheral business issue. One day you'll be working in a corporate or related or different sector, and we're hoping that by then, sustainability will be form a critical part of every single business's operations and strategy. So this idea is called mainstreaming sustainability. And the definition is where a business treats environmental and social issues as part of their core business, rather than just a public relations or corporate responsibility exercise, or in other words, on the periphery of the business. In a study by Birrell, Ivy, and McKay in 2020, the authors studied 44 heads of sustainability companies around the world, and they explored what they did to build sustainability into their organization. And they identified three key areas. Now, post COVID-19, it's obviously a huge opportunity to think about how to rebuild greener and more sustainable economies when business activity resumes as normal. So by following these three approaches, there is an opportunity to build greener essentially. So the first one is assimilation. And what this, what this study found was that in companies that adopt an assimilation approach, they focus simply on conforming to the existing organizational mindset that's focused on profit. 
examining how sustainability helps with cost savings, efficiencies, or sales. Now, with the assimilation approach, it's very much where sustainability remains at the periphery rather than, and than the core. Now, businesses that adopted a mobilization approach, they found that they continue to conform to the existing mindset in some ways, but also began leveraging pockets of the organization, such as warming up specific senior executives, um, exciting interested departments like research and development, or initiating pilot sustainability projects. They achieved a greater integration of sustainability than the assimilation approach, but still not that wholesale transformation. And then the final group, the transition group. So those companies that adopted this approach, they could, did still continue to conform to some elements of the existing mindset and leverage specific pockets. But they also focused on really shaping policies, processes, and attitudes towards sustainability principles. So they did this through things like organization-wide training, communication and recruitment, and things like that. They also achieved a higher level of integration of sustainability. Um, and this ensured that sustainability became a central element of their business model and approach, basically affecting key decisions and future direction of the company. So they made it mainstream. So if you're wondering, well, how can you mainstream sustainability? Or how can you move into that transition um, group? Well, firstly, and what this topic is really focused on, you should have a strong business case and develop a vision based on that business case. It's also important to choose a framework that best fits your particular organization. We'll look at some of these in future classes, but essentially, what sustainability framework best fits your type of organization and core business? So if you are heavily manufacturing driven, you know, then you might focus on a framework that looks at circularity or efficiencies. If you're a service business or if you have an impact and work with local communities, you might cho choose something like um, natural step or another framework that is more aligned with your particular type of business. It's also important to conduct a sustainability assessment or audit. So a picture of where you are today in terms of your sustainability initiatives. And then, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't implement it. You know, there's that saying. So it's important to define metrics and set sustainability strategies and targets as well that you can, that where you're able to track your progress. And then finally, like we saw with the group, with the transition group, it's important to obviously implement these programs effectively, train your employees, set up management systems and structures to ensure that these actions are continuing and that there is also continuing monitoring and reporting of the progress that's been made. So this diagram on, um, on the slide shows the cycle of sustainability planning. So all sustainability initiatives go through a cycle of planning, implementation, monitoring, and review, where adjustment and improvement is ongoing, not only within each cycle, but also from one cycle to the next, and also, in fact, iterative within these um, the individual steps of the planning process. So, you know, when, when you learn about systems, you learn that they're continuous feedback loops which are important in order to be able to track um, how you're progressing within the entire system. So just to conclude, building a strong business case helps create buy-in on the part of boards and the executives of the organization. It's important to tie the business case for sustainability with the firm's mission and create a short, medium, and long-term plan with ambitious goals. Okay, so you can have goals such as company-wide zero waste, being carbon neutral, using 100% renewable energy sources, closed-loop closed production, or workforce gender parity. 
It's also useful to align business goals with the sustainable development goals that you've learned about. So not only goals for the business, but also how your particular goals contribute to the global goals. Now for the review and reflect part of this Tylo, we're going to look at how you can make sustainable finance more mainstream or rather how this is already happening. So according to the European Commission, sustainable, sustainable finance generally refers to the process of taking due account of the environmental, social and governance or ESG considerations when making investment decisions in the financial sector, which then leads to increased longer term investments into sustainable economic activities and projects. More specifically, environmental considerations may refer to climate change or the environment more broadly, such as the preservation of biodiversity, pollution prevention, and the circular economy. The social considerations in this case may refer to issues of inequality, inclusiveness, labor relations, investment in human capital and communities, as well as human rights issues. So we know that the financial sector has a really key role to play because it can reorient investments towards more sustainable technologies and businesses. It can finance growth in a sustainable manner over the long term. And finally, it can contribute to the creation of low carbon, climate, climate resilient and more circular economies. So this video highlights how sustainable finance is becoming more mainstream. Geneva, a global hub for wealth management and international organizations. Two very different worlds located on different sides of the lake. But on the 10th of October, some 800 delegates from these sectors came together to discuss how they can achieve the same goal, scaling up sustainable finance. We asked some of the speakers what challenges need to be tackled. I think there are a few things. First of all, we have to come up with a common language. We have to make sure investors, if it comes to investors and companies that we finance through credit, understand what we mean when we say capital is interested in accelerating this transition or the creation of solutions towards sustainable or more sustainable worlds. And I think in this respect, uh, the taxonomy is very important, the standards are very important, but perhaps also in incentives with regard to regulation that we could perhaps propose uh, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at the international level will be uh, certainly initiatives that we should take after this conference that shows a lot of convergence already. My impression is for a lot of people, the discussion is still about a niche. How can we um, develop some nice green products or sustainable products um, to offer to a certain, uh, certain type of customer? If we take these trans this transition serious, if we take the SDG serious, then um, we have to be, it has to be about more than that. It has to be the mainstream. We really need to move this mainstream. And you can't today position yourself as a financial actor as we've got this little tiny offering which is sustainable and then we've got 80% of our what we do which is not sustainable. You've really got to apply standards across the board. The, the market actors just don't understand it, will not comprehend if you just treat it as a niche. So that to me is the biggest challenge. How can we move to scale much, much faster? We had the banks uh, last week signing the Responsible Banking Principles, the UN. And one of uh, the goals of this is to reduce investments in fossil fuels. Uh, but uh, how, how, can we, how can they go about uh, doing this without you know, cutting off, severing investment entirely in one go? Well, it is a transition, and I don't think anyone's expecting them to just drop everything on day one, but I think it has to be a fast transition. And there needs to be a pathway which they explain to, to their investors, to the public um, that they're on and where they're giving concrete numbers of how they're achieving that transition. So I think I, we really welcome the, the announcements we heard um, in New York. Um, I think it's a great step forward. I think what we need to see now is the action behind it and the numbers backing it up. With more than 1.9 trillion US dollars poured into fossil fuel financing by global banks since 2015, we asked UBS Chief Executive Sergio Omotti what efforts the Swiss banking giant is making to move out of unsustainable investments. We have been doing a lot, including pressure to uh, and, and, and facilitating uh, the, the transition.
from uh, old technology to new technology and phasing out of certain activities. And we are very careful uh, about how we do it. And we are, you know, we are getting also the recognitions by uh, many uh, uh, NGOs for, for that. So I think that is a matter of time. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have to always measure collateral damages for everything we do. Simon Zadek, uh, we have heard several people on stage today, lots of bankers, financial institutions, talking about how they are stepping up efforts to work towards sustainable development goals, but also the fact that they need to make a return for their clients. I mean, what would you like to say to those wealth managers and bankers who spoke today? Thank you. Global financial and capital markets manage $300 trillion worth of assets. And those assets belong to us, to normal people in the street, through their savings, through their investments, through their pension funds, through their insurance policies, and so on. Yeah. So the very first thing I'd like to say uh, is that those individuals whose savings the financial sector manages on their behalf should have a greater say over how those finances are used. And fintech, you know, the digitalization of financial systems, uh, allows that to happen. It allows citizens you know, to take a more active role in making decisions about how they save, decisions about how they invest, decisions about how they lend, and frankly, decisions about what governments they vote for based on the accountability and transparency of public financing. And once the dust has settled after this week, what concrete action can we see then from both from the Swiss authorities and the private sector and uh, the UN in bringing about some of the points that have been raised? Yeah, I think from, uh, let's take the UN, for instance, we, we are here all together. It's a 15 minutes tramway uh, uh, ride to go and discuss with the SDG lab from wherever, wherever here in Switzerland uh, or in Geneva, I should say. If we, if we were to think about an initiative, I think, how to better hardwire the uh, sustainable, finance, or sustainable development goal into financial decision. That's one. And that's, uh, that has to do with methodologies, with research, with data, et cetera, et cetera. Technology is available here. Let's put all this at work to make sure we could do that hard wiring. On the regulatory point of view, we see that our authorities, the president of the Swiss Confederation was here and said sustainable finance is strategic for the country and that means that our regulatory framework will have to evolve and we want to contribute and to be early in the regulation. So we will have to work more together coming after just the uh, result of the expert group that has now been called by the Federal Council. And finally, we need to be better in educating also not only our own skills but also our clients. Transparency, yes, but clarity in the narrative, good explanation and demonstration that sustainable, that sustainable investing brings better results. Well, I think this is an exciting conference because it shows that the Swiss financial sector is taking this topic of sustainable finance seriously. Uh, but I think it's the first step. I think uh, other centers have actually moved faster than Switzerland has. And I, th I think Switzerland now really has to position itself by really going for quality in terms of what's the impact that we're achieving with these investments and avoiding some of the greenwashing which has been happening where just anything sustainable, anything gets called sustainable because it's the flavor of the month. Listen, I think this week is a, is a huge step in the right direction. Um, I really think the mere fact that we managed to not only you know, go beyond the virtual bridge to actually really create a real bridge between both communities is, is a huge success. Of course, it's not enough, um, but it's it's part of the it's part of the process uh, in in ensuring that more that more capital actually flows for and to the SDGs at country level. Um, we can't build Rome in a day, um, but definitely this is a very strong signal from both communities that they're ready um, to actually work together and realize that they have expertise that complements each other, and that alone, nor one community nor the other can um, can deliver on the SDGs. And we've heard a lot um, at the summit about, um, you know, the two sides really. There's the sustainable development goals, but then a lot of the conversation is centering around the around environmental social governance. How do we reconcile these two things together? You know, I think ESG alone um, is is like is like running a race and 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 stopping in the middle of the race, right, or or, or before the finish line. Um, remaining at the ESG level is not an option. We today have a historic framework, which is called the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which brings us a step further in terms of our global ambition to address the global challenges of our world, and that is the only way forward. 
Um, the transition will take time, and that is normal, uh, and we need to give time to time and accompany also the finance community in being able to transition towards the sustainable development goals. And on the other hand, make sure that we keep the momentum so that we don't lose um, the, all the energy and dynamic that has been created by these 193 countries that are behind this uh, Agenda 2030 or the SDGs, as you say. Okay, so that's it for this topic. Um, remember to prepare for next week. Make sure that you read ahead, um, review today's materials, complete any assessments that are due, and any online and prescribed readings in preparation for next week. Thank you.